Welcome to Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast, the show where we seek to uncover what leadership means in today's world. I'm Joe Hart, CEO of Dale Carnegie, and we will be talking to diverse leaders with stories to tell across various industries to help unlock your potential for success. We will be sharing real life insights into leadership, which in turn can help spark the next level of your growth as a leader. Today's guest is a person who has dedicated his life to military service, international diplomacy, and teaching countless young people to be strong leaders. He is a retired admiral in the United States Navy. He has served as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under Presidents Bush and Obama, and he is or has been a board member on multiple organizations, including General Motors, Sprint, the Bloomberg Philanthropies, Caltech, the Naval Academy Foundation, and Harvard Business School, among many others. Please welcome the 17th Chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Michael Mullen. Admiral Mullen, it's such an honor to be with you. Thank you for being on the Dale Carnegie Take Command podcast. Thanks, Joe. It's really good to be with you as well. Well, thank you. And I'm really excited about the conversation that we're about to have, especially given your background and all that you've accomplished You were the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. You were appointed by President Bush, reappointed by President Obama, which I know is not always easy to be reappointed by a new administration. You've accomplished incredible things in your career. Tell us a little bit about you, about how you joined the Navy, about how you started your career, and some of the key milestones. We're all grounded in you know where we came from, and I'd first start with my family. And I grew up in the movie and entertainment business in Hollywood in the fifties and sixties. And I was the oldest of five kids, you know, lower middle class family, never wanted for much, and was a very local kid. I mean, didn't really get out of the state except once when I was eight years old. And my parents were both depression kids, and they had both come to California. My dad from Chicago, and my mom from Iowa. And as the oldest of five kids, somehow it was imbued in me by my parents that I was going to go to college. I was a good high school athlete. I played basketball and I had made a decision actually to go to the University of California at Santa Barbara and play basketball on a very modest scholarship. When the father of a dear friend of mine, who was a year ahead of me in high school, pulled me aside and said, you really ought to look at Annapolis. And now his son had gone the year before. He was a football player. So I started looking at that. And my father, who had four kids behind me, didn't know much about the Navy or Annapolis. And I didn't either, really. But he did say to me, if you're going to get a good education, you better get somebody to pay for it. And so the Naval Academy recruited me to play basketball. It was on the East Coast, and I had a hankering, still unexplainable, to go East. I'd never been back there. Bill Bradley was a top basketball player in the country back then. I loved Bradley. He was at Princeton. I wasn't going to be able to get into Princeton, nor was I going to play basketball there. This was an opportunity that opened things up for me. My classmates, uh, over a thousand of them, they were from all over the country and they were great young men. And quite frankly, my world just sort of opened up because I got exposed immediately to different cultures, different parts of the country. And my 17-year-old mind was, well, I'll stay here for a couple of years, and then I'll go back and go to UCLA. But it was a very demanding four years. And in that, meeting these kids and the challenge that was significant, I've always been someone that has responded to a challenge. I'm willing to work hard. I got that from my mom and dad. I knew I needed a place that had some discipline. I knew I needed a place that had some structure. I had good grades in high school. But I really had to work at the Naval Academy. And so that's how I got started. And as I said at the beginning, Joe, I really look back to the values that I got from my mom and my dad and my coaches and teachers and the people that impact all of us when we're young that really stood me well in making that decision and going off to Annapolis. So it was almost by not happenstance that you ended up going to Annapolis. I mean, certainly that wasn't your initial thought when you were leaving high school. Was it your initial thought to embark upon a career in the military after Annapolis, or what was your thought process at that time? No, not at all. I got married a couple of years after I graduated. Deborah, who I dated when I was a senior at Annapolis, but we didn't get married until 1970, having graduated in 1968. And I told her our obligated service, how long we would stay in the Navy after we graduated. Mine was five years. So when I married her, I said, we'll do five years and we'll come back home. That was one of many, not intentional lies, but certainly she reminds me of that occasionally. 
what the Navy did for me is it gave me a lot of responsibility and it just opened up so many doors and so many opportunities. And I found that I had, you know, an ability with people. It was very exhilarating to me. One of the first ships I commanded as a young officer, 26 with a hundred sailors, I got a taste for command, command of a ship and command period. And the authority, the responsibility, the accountability that goes with that deployed to the Mediterranean, actually in the middle of the 1973 war in the Eastern Mediterranean, all of which was very exciting. It was a mission worth doing, obviously for the Navy and for my country. And the Navy was great about giving me more and more responsibility over time. I kept taking good jobs, hard jobs that were tied to leadership, and I didn't see any reason to do anything else. What was it about leadership? And we'll talk more about leadership in this conversation. I know you're passionate about leadership. You're having this exposure to that experience. What was it that really touched kind of this passion within you? I loved sports as a kid, and I was very comfortable in that environment. And the same was true, just turns out, when I got onto a ship, I was really comfortable out with the troops. It's a relatively confined space. You're within three or 400 feet of everybody you're working with all the time. And my own view is to succeed in that regard, you need to be out and about in the workplace, which I did all the time. And you're never closer to the troops than in those first couple of tours. And so I spent a lot of time with them and I found out I had a knack understanding them. I had a knack for helping them solve their problems. And in doing that, they would help me solve mine. There isn't anybody that joins any organization, I don't think. And certainly it was true in the military that doesn't want to move up, that doesn't want to improve themselves, whether it's education or training or increased responsibility. And I found that in spades in the military. And so I spent a lot of my time with them trying to understand their challenges, understand their career paths. How do you move? How do you get promoted? How do you get better? How do you achieve those kinds of things? And found that to be something I really love doing. And actually that piece in and of itself, that focus on people, how do you move forward in an organization and in that making the organization succeed. And that has stayed with me literally to this day. It sounds like it has. And another thing I'm hearing is that you're very passionate about trying to see things from the other person's point of view. So you're talking about the people with whom you were working and you're trying to bring the best out in them. And you really are trying to put yourself in their shoes at that time. Is is that where you felt you learned that? Well, I think, Joe, I was actually doing more of that than I realized than I was trying to do. Right. I mean, I've always been a good listener and I seek to listen. It wasn't until I was actually a much more senior officer where I sort of actively made sure that I tried to see a problem from someone else's eyes. I mean, I got involved with some very senior people in countries all over the world, some of them with pretty lousy backgrounds. I always try to approach it, at least going far enough along with them to try to understand their problem from their perspective. And in doing that, it gave me the ability to try to figure out how to help solve difficult problems. They're not going to be solved by themselves, and they're not going to be solved just on one side of the equation. It's going to take both sides to resolve what are very difficult issues. And so I think I did that. That was just part of me when I was young. And then that translated into a very significant part of who I was when I was a senior officer. It's interesting to hear you describe this leadership, particularly in the military. I think there's a perception outside of the military that there is a, well, there is a command and control. There's a hierarchy that's absolutely important. What I also hear you saying, though, is there's still this layer. You really have to be able to interact with people. It's not as simple as just issue a command. And No, not at all. In fact, well, actually, in the military and outside, if you just try to command people around, you're going to lose them. You're not going to generate the kind of capacity and capability your organization has. And eventually, they'll turn you off. They may do what you say, but you won't stimulate the imagination. You won't stimulate the kind of innovation. You won't stimulate solutions you never even thought of because they really are tied to how you view the world and they're very supportive of you as a leader. If you are in a situation where they don't do that, then I think you're very limited in what you can do, you know, as a leader. And there is this perception, you know, longstanding about, well, just give them an order and they'll carry it out. My own view is I reserve that for, you know, very rare circumstances. We're not having a conversation here Now, this is what we're going to do. We're trained to do it. We've talked about it before in many cases, or we're in the middle of a crisis. And I have at that point, hopefully as a leader, garnered enough trust and respect 
from the people who are in my organization that they're not going to question me either, you know, when we really need to go and don't have time to talk about it or when we're in a crisis. So how do you gain that trust, particularly you're 26 years old, you're commanding your first ship. I mean, you've got a lot of people who may be older than you, not prepared to trust you. How do you gain trust in a situation like that? My own view is you have to be there for them. One, two is you have to be competent at what you're doing. I mean, one of the reasons I loved command, even at that age, was it's rife with this value of accountability. You give me the responsibility and I'm accountable. I love the challenge of being held accountable for mission success. And that drove me. I tried to generate that kind of feeling or that kind of responsibility and value in my team, if you will. So that's part of it. When you fail, it's yours. You know, It's mine as the CEO. Part of the joy of commanding a a ship, and I did that three times, is you're responsible for everything, the good and the bad. And when the bad occurs, you have to take responsibility, even if somebody else did it intentionally or unintentionally. And I love the scope and the challenge of that responsibility. And when you stand up for them, particularly in a situation like that, where you're not blaming them, but you're taking it for the organization itself, the troops will respond very, very quickly and trust you. And, and in my own case, the first time I got this ship underway, and again, I'm 26, it's 100 sailors. You know, I actually coming back into port, I hit a buoy. When you're on a ship, it's never good to hit anything, never good to collide with anything. And literally got an evaluation, which essentially ended my career. And a lot of people, including some of my mentors said, you took too much risk taking this command early. One, and two, look what's happened. Your career is now over. Well, it took me 11 years to recover from that failure, but I was able to command again. I learned a lot. When I talk about leadership a lot, I do talk about failure rather than success. And to me, it's not the failure itself. It's how did you handle the failure? Did you get back up off the deck? Did you learn the lessons? And what kind of example you show when you fail? Because we all fail. We're humans. We're going to do that. And I've never argued for a strategy of failure because I've learned a lot in failure, but people fail and you have to hold yourself accountable for that. And when you do that, the people will come to you very, very quickly. At least that's what I found. It's such an important point. And I'm, I'm really grateful for your authenticity and your vulnerability around this. One of my favorite things about preparing for this interview is watching your David Letterman interview from oh, yeah. Yeah. 2001. You're in national TV and you're very open and you're talking about, hey, you know, I had these challenges and how you overcame them. But going back to failure, so many leaders and particularly young leaders feel like I can't fail and they're afraid to fail. Or they're yeah. just yeah. deadly afraid of failing. And yet, you had this experience. How did you overcome that? I mean, so you hit this buoy. It's a major thing. You're getting written up. What did you find within yourself? And what advice would you give for others who have those kinds of incidents in their careers? So I was married about three years at that time, no children. That was the first time I had failed in her eyes. So there's a real personal aspect to failure, not just sort of the public piece or what you're doing in the workplace. She just such a beacon for me and a stalwart foundation for, okay, this is, you know, encouraging me, if you will, to do the right thing. But I had a great deal of confidence in my ability. At this point, I'd been in the Navy only five years, but that had been reinforced by success, that I knew what I was doing. I understood the business. I loved what I was doing. I loved the people. I loved the mission. I loved going around the world, you know, again, the world sort of opening up the international aspect of connecting with cultures all over the world that I had no idea about, quite frankly, growing up in Southern California. I really wanted to continue that. And that's what put me on that road for 11 years, if you will, to recover. And when I say recover, I mean, the Navy is very careful about selecting people for command. And 11 years later, literally on my last review or my last look of any substance, the Navy selected me having passed me by for two straight years and gave me another opportunity. And the military, the Navy specifically, by and large, it's a meritocracy. And it's one of the things I loved about it. So it wasn't, you know, a one mistake and it's over kind of thing. If you compete and it's very competitive, by and large, the Navy will pick the best people to do the job. And that's really at every level. That's one of the reasons I stuck around. I loved what I did you know, I was intent on doing everything I could to try to succeed again. The other aspect too, Joe, that I think is really important is 
for the two major failures that I had, one then and then I had one years later in another ship when I was much more senior, I had mentors of mine who essentially I could not have gotten through the crisis, professional or personal, without their mentorship. And these were self-selected mentors. One of them was this commanding officer I'd had on my second ship. This oiler that I failed on was my third, who basically was the reason you know I stayed in the Navy. He made it fun. He was one of these guys that just showed me things I never thought I would see. He himself had had command when he was young lieutenant, and he's the one who encouraged me to go do that. But he also had been around the system a lot. So when I failed there, he could help me navigate through the system. And it took me two and a half years to get the bad paper out of my record, as is the case now when I talk to young people about leading now and, and in the world we're living in, in terms of emails and texts. I said, when you write stuff, it's there forever. And someone might tell you it isn't, but it is there in the digital age. 30 years later, when I'm retiring, this piece of paper was redacted from my record, never to be seen. All that's to say is it took this out of my record. It took me two and a half years to do that. And again, 11 years to recover. But this mentor thought I had a future. And the same was true later on when I feel I had a couple of mentors then who were admirals at the time that thought I had a future and helped make way for me and give me confidence or reaffirm the confidence they had in me so that I could move forward. And without that, well, I wouldn't have been around after the first one. One of the challenges many people have is they want to do things themselves. They're afraid to take mentors. They feel like if they're accepting help from somebody else, and I've talked to a lot of people who feel this way. I felt this way at different points you know, myself, but have since learned the value of working with other people and learning from other people. I mean, the mentors you had really were, it sounds like a key to your ability to push through that difficult time. The other thing I can't help but observe is that your character, I mean, you didn't have to just stay with this for a year or two. You stayed with it for 11 years. Yeah. And that must have taken incredible perseverance and persistence and commitment and so forth, which then leads me to another thought. I know values are an important yeah. part of your view of leadership. Yeah. Where do values tie into leadership in general, when you're teaching people about leadership, what are the role of values? Well, as I think I discussed briefly with you before, I teach leadership now at Annapolis and I teach seniors. So these are the young men and women who are about to get commissioned and will go out and take those jobs just like I did over 50 years ago. Before that, though, I taught at Princeton for six years and I taught at the International School, what used to be the Wilson School, properly renamed from my perspective. And I taught a course on the balance of military and diplomatic power, but included in that was a section on values. And the reason I did that is when we talk about leadership today in a world that's pretty confused, is hitting you from every single direction, accelerated by the social media impact, et cetera. When it comes to making decisions, what I tried in both courses is you need to create a framework for yourself of things that you believe in what your values are and what your principles are. And you need to sort of think that through ahead of time. And then when you get into a situation that is incredibly confusing, rely on those values. Use that framework to make decisions. So one is it's obviously exceptionally high in the military and certainly at Annapolis is the value of integrity. Don't ever, ever walk away from integrity. No matter what happens, you can always look yourself in the mirror and know you did the right thing, and then move forward, and you'll be okay. I talk about accountability. You know, I learned that early. And, and I, what I've seen, I've been retired now for almost 10 years, so I've been in the private sector a lot. The lack of understanding of accountability there is, you know, pretty significant. Very rarely, if ever, do I see anybody in the private sector do what I saw Jim Burke do from uh, Johnson & Johnson in the Tylenol crisis, I think in 1981 or 1982, where, I mean, literally, he took responsibility, took every single bottle off the shelf, you know, within a very short period of time. I see too many people lawyering up, communicating, getting communicators to try to protect the decision that they make. And the other thing that happens in that lack of accountability, if you will, is it takes, if you have an accountable leader and you've had a tragedy or a problem and the leader takes responsibility, you accelerate the ability of the institution to heal whatever actions are going to be required. And when you have leaders in denial that won't hold themselves accountable, it stretches the ability of the institution to recover by an order of magnitude, by an order of 10 or something like that. And I've watched that in the Navy, sadly, 
in the 90s when we went through the tailhook scandal that we had. No senior aviator took responsibility for that. And it took us a decade or a decade and a half. And in some ways, it's even still being discussed along those lines. So accountability is another value. Seeking responsibility. Back to the integrity piece, one of the guys I focus on in my leadership course is Jim Stockdale, who was a Medal of Honor winner, you know, POW in Vietnam for seven and a half years. He was very focused on the leadership aspect of all of that, particularly after the fact. He talked about actions taken as a POW to make sure you don't stain your soul so that it's something you'll never, ever, ever be able to overcome or not know or not regret. And so I talk about those kinds of things with young leaders and try to get them to establish this framework for themselves. What do they believe in? And I hand them a copy of two documents when I took over as the head of the Navy and as I took over as chairman, you know, I put out two or three pages of these are my beliefs so that you got a new leader. It's a big job. Here's what I stand for. And I hold myself accountable to those as well because now they're out there to your people. And so I really try to focus on who they are. And I also, one last point on this, I've also found that when you're in a crisis, if you haven't thought these through, if you haven't sort of put some guardrails on yourself in a minute, in a crisis, you're going to roll and you're going to make the wrong decision. My own counsel, and I did this for myself, was when I took over as chairman, you know, so now I'm in and out of the White House constantly. So I'm with the most powerful individual in the world And I need to have walked through what my guardrails are on major issues, even before I know what the issues are, so that I'm not forced to just depend on instinct in the moment in a crisis when you're standing there in the Oval Office and you have to make a decision or a recommendation. So much of this is innate in you. You grew up, many of these values kind of hardwired in you. Did you actually go through a process or do you advise young leaders? I'm thinking about many of our listeners too. Many of our listeners are young leaders. Do you encourage people to sit down and to take a day or some period of time and actually reflect upon their values, write those things down then and have those things so that they have them? Or what do you teach in Annapolis? I think one of the things all leaders need to do is follow their own advice. It's one thing to give it to somebody, but you also have to follow it. And on the reflection piece, what I found is over you know three or four decades is I didn't do much reflection. What I have discovered with a little more time on my hands in both these courses is an opportunity to reflect myself. What did I learn and how do I articulate it, describe it, and then pass it on because I'm here because people pass it on to me. This has been evolutionary for me, how valuable reflection has been. And so my last assignment for these the young students at Annapolis in the one class that I teach is, you've been here almost four years, three and a half years. Your last paper, which is 40% of the courses, I want you to reflect on what you've learned about leadership here and your leadership experience here. Most of them have not done that. They say that literally in the paper. It's the first time I've done it. And what I would encourage leaders to do is to take the time to do that. And I also encourage these young ones because they're living in such a consequential time to journal Obviously, journaling, if you do that, even if it's just scribbling at the end of the day, would allow you to reflect, I think, more effectively, you know, on who you are, what you stand, how, what happened, et cetera, and how do you improve in the future and what matters to you, you know, in your life. That's really key. So when I talked about following your own advice, I advise that now, but growing up, I didn't do much of that. It's a great insight that you've gained from experience. I know myself, Many years ago, my dad had talked about having a value statement, a vision, mission for myself that I would look at, you know, frequently and so forth. And it sounds like this, what you're saying is you're encouraging people, take the time to be reflective, take the time to think about these things before you're in their situation. So you became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Would you explain what exactly that role is? Many people may not know what that is. And talk about some of the experiences you had in that role that were enlightening or defining for you in some ways. Coming up, people ask me, did you always think you were going to be an admiral? I had no clue I was going to be an admiral. What I thought I would do is what I've talked about, command ships. And if the Navy had said to me, after commanding my third ship at the 21 or 22 year point, we don't have a future for you, I would have saluted, marched off, said, thanks a lot. I've had a great life. I'll go figure the rest out. The Navy chose otherwise and did promote me. And the same is true for becoming chairman. And I, against the grain, I never went to headquarters when I was young. My advice is, and the advice I got 
was go to headquarters, even though it's tough. And I tell that to anybody these days, almost in any organization. At headquarters, big decisions get made. You see how the sausage gets made and you need to have that experience. I got there very late. But then once I was there, I was there a lot. I had a very hard time getting away. I did for two or three relatively short periods of time and tours, but I had no expectation, one, to run the Navy or get promoted to four stars, which is you know the path to that, much less once I was running the Navy. Now, I'd been in the town you know, 10 years or so. I was in the building, you know, at 9-11. The plane actually flew in under my office. I was removed by about 75 or 100 feet. But my two executive assistants looked at the fourth deck of the Pentagon and saw 757 fly in under their feet. I had been there a while in a very, very difficult time. uh, And you think you know what's going on. I'm two years into this job as the head of the Navy in 2007. I'm a member of the Joint Chiefs. The Joint Chiefs are, then it was the chairman, the vice chairman, and the head of all the services. So it's six of us. So I'm a member of that group as the senior military officers in the United States military. But I was very focused on the Navy, less focused on what we call the joint requirements, the requirements outside your own service. And I was two years into that, and I thought it was going pretty well. I had a four-year plan. I go down to see my boss, and this is a lesson for all of us as well, certainly was for me. I go down to see my boss, who was Bob Gates, who had come in to relieve Dom Rumsfeld in May of 07, and I had made the appointment myself to talk to him about something that obviously is of no consequence at this point. And I walk into his office, and the first thing I see, I notice there's nobody in there with Gates. There's no horse holder around. Well, that was unusual. So I knew something was going on, and I sit down at this table next to him. Gates starts talking to me. And about 10 seconds in, I figure out where this is going. President Bush is going to ask me to become chairman. I had no idea. And the reason I talk about the lesson is when you think you know what's going on, you don't. And whenever you're thinking like that, that's lousy thinking because there's always a lot going on. I'm a good communicator. I've been in town a year. I had good relationships, a good network. I had no idea this was coming. President Bush wanted me to become chairman behind Pete Pace who I had gone to the Naval Academy with. And I had known Pete literally decades at that point. And what happened was Pete got caught up in the politics of Iraq and he couldn't be renewed for a second two years. All of us thought he would be. So all of a sudden now I'm in a brand new job and it is a great privilege. It's a great country, a kid from, you know, middle-class kid from Southern California can rise to the number one job in the United States military. And when you go into the White House, complex, the hair on your neck ought to go up every time. And when it stops going up, you know, you need to leave. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect that I didn't understand was there's whatever the number is, a thousand people in that White House working to generate good political outcomes 24-7, 365. I am apolitical. I'm in the military. I'm an advisor to the president. That's it. I don't command anything at that level. My task is to, by law, give him and the Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, and the National Security Council my best military advice. I'm the only military guy in a room. We're in two wars, by the way. We're in Iraq and Afghanistan. We're also got a pretty significant war footing effort out against terrorists. And here I am, a sailor at this point, walking into this at a failed time in the Bush administration with respect to the Iraq war. This was during the surge in Iraq, which turned it around. So a whole new world. So one of the lessons is don't ever think you know everything that's going on because you don't, even as a senior officer. And two, how do you get ready for this? And I don't have a great answer for that. What I tell young people about getting ready for the future from a leadership standpoint is you need to take the toughest assignments you can possibly take. That's where you're going to learn. That's where you're going to fall on your face, get up. That's where you're going to succeed. And that will prepare you better than just about anything else in a world, quite frankly, that is much, much more global now than it was when I was coming up. And and the requirement to understand other countries, other cultures, other people, other challenges, the global economy is just doing this. You know, we're all required to understand that. And to the degree we don't do that and stand off and just sort of expect it to come out well, I think that's a failed strategy. Well, there's so many lessons in what you've talked about, Admiral Mullen, and I could start in a lot of different places. Where I'd like to ask, though, is 
You were in this role. You were one of the joint chief staff yeah. members. You weren't expecting this appointment. You were surprised by it. President Bush could have picked anybody, any of the others who were there. What do you think it was about you and what qualities did they see in you that said Admiral Mullen needs to be our person? One of the things that Gates has written about and has spoken publicly about was we're in two wars now. Now, this goes back to me to Vietnam. And when the war in Iraq started, I had two thoughts. Will the American people blame the United States military, which they did for Vietnam? And I'm of that generation and I was in that war. And secondly, will we generate a significant cadre of homeless vets as we did after that war? For the first couple of years in the war, I pulsed that all the time, and I became convinced that the American people were not going to do that, and they didn't do that. For the second part, we actually have done that, and you know, that's a subject for you know, another conversation. The point is the scars I had from back then in the 60s, which was a very tough time, I brought that with me. Part of this was, for me, being in war, I knew... The army bears the brunt of the conflict. They're going to deploy the most troops. They're going to lose the most troops. They're going to need the most resources, et cetera. When I was running the Navy and had no idea that this other job would ever be something I would do or be asked to do, but I made a speech saying, the United States Army is the center of gravity for our military, and we all need to chip in to make sure the Army does well, because when the Army does well, we all do well. And when the army doesn't do well, we don't. And that had been my lived experience. That really got Gates's attention. One is I wasn't focused on the Navy, even though I was the head of the Navy. And I certainly had some challenges in that regard. My view is that Gates wanted and President Bush wanted somebody that hadn't been involved. When Pete Pace had been involved for literally four years as the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs and then two years as chairman. And they wanted a fresh face in that regard from a different service. I mean, Gates didn't know me that well. And honestly, President Bush didn't know me that well. He did his own due diligence in that regard. And I had a good reputation in town. I had a good reputation, quite frankly, on Capitol Hill with both sides of the aisle. And I'm sure that was a part of it as well. So it was those kinds of things that led President Bush to make the selection. You also had excellent interpersonal skills, communication skills. You talked about communication early on and how important I think communication is. Talk about that. What did you learn over your career that helped you interact with all kinds of different people? You were dealing with foreign leaders. You mentioned you were dealing with some people that weren't always great people. You had to deal with all kinds of people. How did you do that? And again, it goes almost goes back to that first deployment. I love the culture in the Asia Pacific. I just, I love that aspect of it. And I wanted to learn more about that. So if I was dealing with somebody from that part of the world, I didn't have to make up that I, you know, love that culture. I acted that way. It was a part of me. So when I became very senior, the sensitivity to culture for me was huge and to understanding challenges from another individual's perspective. And one of the things we don't do well in America, we don't do history well. So I encourage and have for a long time, understand history better, understand the culture that goes along you know, with that history. And what I've also found is even if you just make a small effort at this, the response from those who live in those cultures is enormous. To some degree, that's almost a sad story because Americans don't spend time on that. It's hugely important. And so I found that a skill set that was very natural to me, one, Secondly, I grew up in a movie business. My dad was a journalism major. He went to Hollywood to take a job, you know, in public relations. And he was a PR guy. And I, you know, almost by osmosis, he was a message guy, you know, and I watched that and was fascinated by it. I didn't study it particularly hard, but I watched how successful he was. And he was a very successful PR guy in what some would say in the heyday of the business. And I think I took those communication skills aboard I'm always comfortable in front of people. It's hard to explain. That doesn't mean I've always done well, but I've always been comfortable in the kind of ability to communicate. Then when I'm running the Navy, you know, I'm now the number one officer in the Navy. And so I can communicate to those who are in support of the Navy. And obviously and it's 360,000 or so troops, sailors, but that's a, turns out that's a pretty narrow audience. When I became chairman, the bully pulpit for me is not just the United States of America, it's the globe. And we're in two wars. And so I wanted to take advantage of those skills to communicate. It wasn't received very well in either the Bush White House or the Obama White House. 
because I was publicly out there. Part of this was Vietnam. I wanted the American people to know that if we have young men and women who are dying in these wars, these young people, they are the face of this war. This is part of what we're doing as a country in fighting these wars. And I didn't want to hide it from them. So I would talk to it. I can't tell you the number of funerals I went to to meet with parents who'd lost, you know, at Arlington or families that Deb and I went to. And she went to the funerals up at Dover when families are meeting their young daughter or son after they've been killed in Iraq or Afghanistan and engaging those families in the toughest conversations in life, quite frankly. There's no other way to explain that. One, I wanted to put a face on this United States military to those families who had paid the ultimate sacrifice. But the other is I wanted the American people to know what the sacrifice was. And in the system that I believe in, say, yes, we're going to keep doing this or no, we're going to stop doing it. So I tried to use the communication skills, if you will, that I had to send those kinds of messages, many other ones as well. And I would use it and I testified many, many, many times in Congress. And I recognize that testimony is Congress, the senators and the representatives, they're the players, if you will, in that arena. But it was a great opportunity for me to engage them and send messages. And it's covered globally. So you can message an awful lot of people. So I really try to do that. And I hired a young guy named John Kirby, who literally today is Secretary of Defense's public affairs type as a civilian. And he's the best guy I ever saw at it. And so the two of us were able to, I think, really take advantage of the skill set you know, that I had. Well, it seemed like that skill set was such a critical part of your career and your success and your ability to be effective as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, whether you're interacting with people or being transparent and communicating. I mean, sometimes people will think that it's the technical skills that are the most important things in a career. I mean, there are great, I'm sure, military tacticians and people that otherwise you might say they were more tactical, but your ability to interact with effectively other people and to communicate seemed like those were just core skills that really enabled you to be so successful. I tell young people today and young people in Annapolis, but I think it's much broader than that is I'm going to pay you a lot of money to go learn how to drive a submarine or a ship and fly an airplane, et cetera. But in the end, what I'm paying you for is leadership. I'm pretty biased here because I think more than any part of who we are, leadership is the most important aspect of solving difficult problems because it's people. And you need to do it by, with, and through, and for your people. And what I've also found out in the Navy, for me, particularly when I was young, is the more I gave them of me, the more they gave it back many fold in terms of what we were trying to achieve. Trying to do it all yourself just isn't going to work. In order to do that, you got to be able to talk to them. And in order to talk to them, you got to be out with them. You know, even in this 10 years that I've been retired and I've done some public speaking around the country, I know I love going into a room and just starting to have a conversation with people. What's on their minds? What are they doing? How are their lives? Is there a way for me to help? You know, that kind of thing. I've been very blessed with not just the skill set, but also the opportunity. I don't want to make it sound like this is just natural because I've worked at this over time. It is something that's good, I think, probably for people to hear that too. Some people think you're born with it or you're not. It is a skill that you can work on over time. You spoke about leadership. You've spoken passionately about leadership. What does leadership mean to you? If you were to define it in a sentence or two, how would you define leadership? To take a foreign organization in which you are leading and to have your people essentially trust and follow you to accomplish your mission and all that that entails. Well, thank you. And that certainly that's what you're teaching people right now in Annapolis when you teach leadership. Yeah. Yeah. As you look over an illustrious career, a career that you're continuing right now in the private sector, you're consulting, you're teaching and so forth. If you were to go back and talk to yourself early on in your career, what might be one or two other things that maybe you tell yourself? Well, one of the things I do is I'd reflect. I would journal and I would reflect. The other, which is change leadership is tough leadership. There's never been a more important time for leaders who can lead at a time of change. And the human being seems to like status quo, don't upset the apple cart, et cetera. And there's nothing but apple carts being turned over. And that's just going to be the case. I've never talked to a strategic leader that thought they were going fast to make change that didn't look back and say, man, I wish I'd gone faster. You almost can't go fast enough because there's so much resistance to change. 
and you have to break those barriers down. I think I would probably focus more on understanding what it means to be a change type leader. And maybe I could have been you know, more effective in that regard. I still think as much as I say I listen, I probably could have listened more. One of the other aspects, and it's one of the reasons I love what I did, I also found as a leader that as I would look up to whatever level you would talk about, and then I would get to the next level, and it wouldn't be very long at that level, whatever it was, where I'd look around and look at my peers who were at that level and say, you know, I can do this. Didn't mean it wasn't tough. It's was the hardest job I've ever had in my life, but that I was confident enough to be able to do that. And the other thing I'd probably do, Joe, as you said, I'd probably, even though I do it, everybody's uncomfortable with feedback, you know, when it's not going well. I wish I had done more of that. I wish I'd listened. I tell leaders, you need somebody that can come in the room, close the door and tell you, hey, that was bad or this is bad and listen to them. And I wish I had one, done more of that and two, been able to get more comfortable even when that was done. And I did a fair amount of that. I had someone that I depended on to do that, two or three actually, that I depended on to do that. And it was still very uncomfortable. One other aspect we haven't talked much about, but particularly as a senior leader, what I also found is the more senior I got, the more diverse backgrounds I wanted around me, the more diverse views I wanted in the room, that would help me more than anything else make the right decision. Well, that's a great quality as well, because many times people have this perception that they don't want to hear other voices. What you're saying is, I want to hear other voices. You talked about journaling, and many people are intrigued about journaling. I've journaled for years myself, and I go back, I've got a decade or more of journals. But when you talk about journaling, what do you mean? What would you encourage people to be journaling about? We are living in extraordinary times, and this is history, and history is happening every single day. And your perspective on that I think will be important one. And two years later, you'll go back. The specifics of it remind you of who you were, as opposed to sort of this, you know, broader generalization, oftentimes, or a lot of the details that we've forgotten. It does create an opportunity to reflect, to go back and reflect. And, you know, I mean, I'm 75, so there's a lot of self-reflection going on right now, just about life. Uh, But at this point, the only thing that matters are, you know, faith, family, and friends. Coming up, what you don't want to do is you don't want to screw that up permanently. I get there's a lot of other things to think about, but that's all that matters at this age for me at this point. And can I continue to make a difference, which I'm trying to do in certain ways? How do you knit all that together from somebody that's now 75 to your entire life? I mean, I'm writing an oral history. There's a lot of detail that I don't have that I wish I had particularly when I was young, when I was younger, you know, which you just sort of blow through those first 30 years or so, you know, having a terrific time. And I mean that in a very positive way, but that aspect of it, I just wish I had so much more detail about what I was doing back then than I do now. They say, and I don't recall who said that a life worth lived is a life worth recording. Yeah. And certainly I found that having a journal allows me to have uh, perspective. I can go look back and see the things I was worried about and say, yeah. gosh, I really have nothing to worry about. Maybe I don't have anything to worry about right now either. Let me yeah. go back for a second to feedback, because what I think I heard you say was, you know, you wish you had given it and maybe received it a little bit differently, but the giving it, I, I know earlier in my career, I found it very hard to give people direct feedback. I didn't want to hurt people's feelings. It's uncomfortable and that type of thing. And over the years, I realized that feedback's a gift. If I need feedback, I want someone to tell me directly so I, I, I could do something about it. Yeah. I mean, is, is that is that what you're talking about when you talk about feedback that you wish you had been able to give direct feedback or was it more receiving or both? Well, I, actually, I think it's both because it's hard to give. I wish I had done more of that. I wish I'd do more of that right now. I've got a couple of situations with companies that I'm working for that I, as a board member, which is not sort of in the chain or in the line, if you will that I look for ways to feed back to the leadership because of what I see that's going on as an example. It's just hard. It really is hard. That said, you know, I did a fair amount of it. I did back to sort of the command and control piece. One of my principles for those that work for me was the bigger you are, the harder you fall. It's easy to hammer the junior people. The more senior people you give them a break. And I made it clear when I took command in any situation, that was not true. My expectations for senior leaders are higher. 
you've been around, you've got more experience, you've got more wisdom, et cetera. And if you violate the rules, you know, the hammer is going to come down. There's not a lot of room for you. And I just seen the opposite, you know, for so long. And I also found out in very difficult circumstances with individuals who were doing poorly, you got to give them that feedback quickly. It's easier for me, much easier for me, and I did it routinely, to feedback to my juniors, if you will, than it was to feedback to those that I was working for, depending on the relationship. And those can be tough conversations. And when you were talking about change, sometimes those are conversations that are required if we're going to move fast and change and be agile, right? Otherwise, we know if you've got a person who's not performing, you've got an issue and the leader's afraid to confront it, everyone sees it. It says something about the leader, it can slow things down. Yeah. So fantastic advice. You've given us so much. Any concluding advice for our listeners, Admiral? As much as people are concerned about the future, and because we've got huge challenges, I don't have to say a lot about that. And usually when I talk to an audience, you know, I'll go through those challenges. We'll go through Q's and A's. And usually they'll be on really, really tough issues that there aren't really clear solutions on. And then someone will raise their hand and say, you got any good things to say here? You know, and this is going through these wars. And I've seen this again in the last 10 years as well. I was so motivated by these young people that I'm dealing with that I actually have great hope for the future. I think this younger generation, I think they're going to change the world. And I think they're going to change the world for the better. And they're going to answer the mail on an awful lot of these challenges that we have. So I'm more confident than a lot that we're going to be okay because I've dealt with so many of them. I remember being that age. And I remember I sort of felt the world was my oyster and that there was no problem I couldn't solve. And we're going to need a lot of that you know, from our younger generations. But I'm very encouraged by what I've seen in the military, as well as what I've seen in the private sector. I think our future is very robust. We're going through some very, very tough times right now. And I understand that as someone that went through the 60s and the Vietnam time frame, we got through that. And there are similarities here. I'm actually encouraged that we will figure out a way to move ahead. And that in great part, these young people, and I've always tried to give back to the young. I've always tried to pay time spend time with the young because I believe so much in their ability for what we need in the future. Awesome. Well, Admiral Mullen, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank Thanks, you for your sir. service. Thanks. And uh, just really, really uh, grateful for our time together. Well, thanks for what you're doing. And hopefully if this impacts, you know, one individual, it's more than worth it. I know that will. Thank thanks. you. Take care. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Take Command, the Dale Carnegie podcast. Check out our resources page at www.dalecarnegie.com for more research, insight, and tools that will support your success in taking command of your leadership potential. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating it and subscribing to us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, thank you for listening. And we look forward to you joining us at the next episode of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast.